morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, hello, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 402 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day, is the evening of Tuesday, June 11th for broadcast on Wednesday, June 12th, and uh, it's still a chilly day here at the Beaver Lodge. Don't know what it will be like tomorrow. Hopefully, it'll be just a teeny bit warmer. I am your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. Big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Before we do anything else today, let's ask Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today, sir? Well, good morning, Mr. Grizzly. Even Mr. Grizzly, Mr. Beaver, I'm Mr. Grizzly. See, I'm a little tired. It's it's actually <laughs> Wednesday evening that we're recording this, and it's been it's, a very long day for me. It's only five after eight, but it's been a long day. And it's been go, 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 go. I've had about Same. 45 minutes of, of chill time. So Same. Yeah, I'm a little I'm a little uh, ragged. You can, I'm still wearing my office clothes, so <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm a tad frazzled. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, it, it's been a, it's been a very busy day, and it's been one of those days where, um, um, actually, it's been like that for like most of the last two weeks. There's like really great stuff, and, then, and major suckage happens simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So I like keep on swinging like from yay to. <laughs> well, I, I still don't know where I'm going to be on Monday, so. Yeah. I had a conversation about that today, and uh, it's like, well, we're, we're still trying to find a placement for you, and if not, maybe we'll get you to do this. And I'm like, okay, if that's what you need me to do, but what about if I work out this? Anyway, I, I, I could be where I am right now come Monday because there's some work that needs to be done that falls mm-hmm. outside of my scope. Mm-hmm. So possibly I'm back there Monday. I I don't know. We, we're don't waiting know. on all these th- things need to fall into place, so... I might have to go back out into the field for a couple of weeks before my vacation begins. So I'm, that's mm. not real exciting to me. Mm. And my boss is like, I, I, I don't want to lose you. So, you know, this would be temporary. I'm like, yeah, I get it. Cause he knows that, um, I'm very happy where I am and that going back out into the field is not appealing to me. So, it, you know, anyway, it's, I don't, I don't, you know what? I don't want to think about it right now. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, we just, don't have to. let's just move it along, shall we? And and, and uh, please, if you may, because we have a special yes. guest with us today. Yes, we do. Uh, as you know, Kids and Cubs, it is um, Mental Health Walk Week. There you go. Here at the Beaver Lodge. The big day is this coming Saturday. Um, of course, as you know, if you are in Ottawa, you are welcome to join us. Meet a, meeting at noon at the Canadian Museum of Nature at the corner of uh, McLeod and uh, um, Metcalf. 
It, yeah, McLeod. It's what's yeah, between, the address is 240 McLeod. Yeah, it's between yeah. McLeod and, and Argyle. It's a block yeah. at the yeah. start of Metcalf, basically. So. Yeah. So we'll be meeting there. Uh, Senator Patrick Brazo will be there. His lovely spouse, Dr. Marie-Claire Brazo, has also uh, confirmed that she will be there. So uh, we will have a senator and a PhD. So there you go. Yes, uh, it's going to be wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, we're selling some T-shirts. Uh, more kids have placed some orders. Thank you very much. Um, people are starting to promote it in other places. Uh, we're getting some buzz. Uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association has called us, uh, so hopefully we'll be able to talk to them tomorrow and see what else we can uh, do with them, even though it's just a couple of days before. But, hey, the more the merrier. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And, again, this was we really yeah. did throw this together kind of last minute. As yeah, yeah. as the kids and cubs would know if, who watch every day, yeah, uh, you know, we've been talking about it for a while, but trying to get everything lined up, everything set up, and, yeah. Anyway. But it's still a fast turnaround time. I think it was, it was yeah. in, like, April we decided that we were yeah. going to go for Yeah, this we kicked and, around the idea and said, okay, let's do it. And then we picked it, like, a couple of days later. It's like, why don't we do it on the 15th of June, the day before Father's Day, so that, you know, because yeah. fathers need help, too, because fathers are men still, right? So Yeah, it, it was, it's a good day for it. Probably wasn't the best day for me to choose after closing three shows. In well, you know, <laughs> I'm a little pooped, but this is the first year, and next my, year, my and next year, we'll be able to do right more. Now, now uh, today, Kit the Cubs, my dog. <laughs> Sorry, uh, delve. Uh, there are many aspects uh, with regard to mental health, mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of them is, of course, addiction. Right. And today we are going to talk addiction, and we have a guest with us. Our guest uh, goes by um, Quick Nick. That's alias, also by Ari. Uh, and um, he hosts a podcast called Addicts in the Dark. Mm -hmm. Now, each one of those episodes in the show features an anon a single anonymous caller that shares mm -hmm. a personal journey with addiction. Callers have up to an hour to discuss their struggles, struggles, challenges, and triumphs openly and honestly, free from judgment or shame. The format allows for deep, meaningful conversations that highlight the transformative power of human connection in recovery. Now, the host, Quick Nick, or Ari, um, knows what he speaks of. Right. When it comes to this podcast, um, because he's had his own journey of overcoming addiction. So with the podcast, he aims to create a safe and inclusive space where individuals can share their stories without fear, amplifying diverse voices and experience. And then the podcast itself strives to break down the stigma of surrounding addiction and mental health struggles, fostering a sense of community and belonging for those navigating the turbulent waters of addiction recovery. And he has been gracious enough to come uh, onto our show and to speak about the work that he does possibly about his own journey. We'll see about mm -hmm. that. Um, our guest has asked, so you know, Kids and Cubs, to uh, be on audio only, which you know, when our guest asks that, we accommodate. Happy to so, accommodate. And we're happy to do so. So uh, you will not be seeing him, but you will be hearing him. Uh, but I do not think in any way, shape, or form that not seeing him is going to detract at all from the no, quality of, of this not. interview. All right, Kids not. and Cubs. So... Even though, well, yeah, even though we can't see them, please put your paws up and give a big round of a pause for a quick Nick or Ari. Hello. Hey guys. How's it Appreciate going? you having me on today. Ah, welcome to the Beaver Lodge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, you know, so, sorry, ahead. all I was going to say was that uh, it, it doesn't detract from my current podcast, but I've always thought about having a video component. The issue on my podcast yeah. would be that the other callers are to remain anonymous. Right. Right. And they do most of the talking on my podcast. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> you guys got it figured out though. So uh, kudos to you. Thanks. Yeah. Now, Ari, uh, like I asked Mr. Grizzly, we start every show asking, how's your mental health today? And we also ask of our guests. So how's your mental health today? It's, uh, it's up and down today. I do mm. appreciate you asking, but, um, I think there's something refreshing about being in an environment where you feel comfortable saying that you're not okay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And 
you know, to be completely transparent, I had mentioned to you, Douglas, earlier in the day that I, I wasn't feeling great, but I also knew that um, this would be the, the highlight of the day, regardless of how I'm feeling. So uh, I do appreciate you having me on, despite uh, some of the struggles I've had of late. Those struggles, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. not not substance ad abuse or addiction related, but um, obviously they at times go go hand in hand. So um, it's it's very fitting to have this conversation today. All right. Well, Excellent. As, 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 an ex, as an extension of that, um, I'm going to be utilizing a different microphone for just a moment here because this is the microphone I use for my mental health chat ASMR show that I also have on YouTube, which kind of falls hand in hand with our mental health walk. It's all sort of intertwined and related to one another, but uh, my ASMR mental health chat slightly different format it's just me talking about my struggles with mental health and how i've been able to uh keep my head above water it's mm -hmm. funny i uh <laughs> i use a totally different register of my voice when i do the podcast and i saw you switch there and um it's interesting that it's an asmr podcast and and it, does that one have video as well yes yeah oh, okay uh, same thing okay I was, I was only asking because um when you when you use that mic it sounds as though you're really like you're talking into the audience's ear and that's what makes podcasting so special oh, yeah. um it feels like you're talking directly to the person who's listening it's not one of those you're not creating content where you're speaking because you're speaking to a niche audience all mm -hmm. the time. Yes. So you have the ability to understand your audience more than you would on maybe a broader medium. Mm -hmm. I come mm -hmm. from radio and okay. uh, top 40 radio in particular. Oh, nice. And uh, we play pop music, which uh, people, when they think of pop music, they often think of a particular timber Right. um of music but really it just means popular music right so uh so before podcasting i was used to speaking to a very general audience and um with my podcast and and with podcasts in general that, that's the beauty of it you're you're speaking directly to your audience um and that's kind of the vibe I got when you switch microphones. It's like you're speaking directly into my ear. That's, that's the general <laughs> idea. And uh, yeah, well, my natural speaking voice is just like this. And when I switch the mic, I go from, from one to the other. And it right. does sound quite a bit different because this is a studio mic. Right. And this is a broadcast mic. But, you know. It, it, you adjust your timbre accordingly. I, I tend to raise my voice a little bit and the pitch up a little bit because when I speak really softly it's hard to hear me if you don't have that mic and the you know what I mean? So anyway. Right. 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 Um, kind of got off topic there. My apologies. Yeah, that happens with right. me. Squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> ADHD. Um, uh, can I ask Ari, um, let's try to go this way. might be the, the easiest uh, way through into it. How did you get to the point where you decided that you would like to host this particular type of podcast and when you're doing it, because like you say, you know, you have uh, guests on and it's quite likely that your guests would want to be anonymous. In fact, your whole concept is anonymous. Um, how do you, how did you get to the point where you decided hey, this is something that I want to do. It's something I think I can contribute. And what were the particular, were there any, like, other than, of course, you know, the anonymous factor, is there particular complications or things that you must really pay attention to or pay some care to when you're doing the type of podcast and the work that you're doing? I mean, I think I need to give some background context because I think the idea had been brewing for years, but I think it's probably best if I start with my battle with addiction, um, okay. which began when I was uh, about 14 years old, um, started as a way to cope with the pressures and insecurities of teenage life. And mm -hmm. that quickly spiraled into a, a problem that followed me into adulthood. Adolescence is a very, um, 
vulnerable time. And for me, yeah. substances became a, a crutch to deal with the anxieties and insecurities. Um, and, and throughout my teenage years, I began pursuing my dream of becoming a radio host. Mm -hmm. And the pressures of that job, it would be easy to say, it would, I don't want to blame anything. I love mm -hmm. that radio industry and the re radio media more than anything, but the pressures of the industry intensified my struggles, but I don't want to make that be, sound like it was because of the industry. It was because of my own internal battle that I guess was exacerbated, mm -hmm. um, by an unspoken expectation to be a type of perfect all the time in radio when you're mm. on the air. You can hear me now when I'm speaking, there's ums and there's pauses. I didn't do any of that when I was on the radio. No, um, of course not. I, I take these liberties now uh, doing yes. them on the radio. Um, and that, that came on the air and off the air as well because you're making plenty of public appearances and so on. But basically what I'm saying is the constant need to maintain a flawless persona exacerbated my addiction. And mm. as I turned to substances to manage my stress and anxiety, the facade of perfection became incredibly isolating and at times damaging and then i hit a turning point when i came to realize that my life was unraveling um despite the success or what i considered success with my career i was deeply unhappy and my mm. addiction took a toll on my relationships and my health um i felt trapped in a cycle that i i needed to break and i knew i needed help so i did at some point reach out to friends and family and professionals and during my recovery one of the hardest but most rewarding decisions i ever made was reaching out to people mm -hmm. and admitted that um i couldn't do it alone and and that i needed support which is why i created the podcast because i wanted to provide a platform where people could share their stories and their struggle maybe in a cathartic sense because addiction as i learned thrives in isolation and oh, yeah. so breaking your silence and uh, using my podcast to allow other people to break their silence could be crucial in their recovery whatever point they're at in their recovery so i wanted to give people a voice and mm -hmm. um and and show other people that they're not alone in their struggles and Overall, I'd say the podcast is about fostering that connection. It's a safe space for people to speak freely about their struggles without judgment, fear, uh, or stigma. But to circle back to the end of your question, Douglas, that was a particular issue that I had. I wasn't particularly okay with me talking about that subject matter to the masses, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. why... I used an alias. I still use an alias, Quick Nick on the podcast, but now I feel more comfortable. The alias is just because the audience knows me as Quick Nick, but at the time, I wanted to keep myself completely protected like the callers were. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, thankfully, because the, the podcast is supposed to be a tool for breaking down stigmas, I do now feel comfortable enough telling the world that I do this podcast and what the subject matter of the podcast is. And um, I'm hoping that by sharing everyone's stories, including my own, we can support each other and show that recovery is possible. And I think each episode is a testament to the strength of the human spirit and the importance of community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, anywhere along the way, Ari, I, I didn't say it at the beginning, but I want you to know, uh, if we ask something uh, that you would rather not answer, uh, it's quite all okay to say, I, I'd rather not talk about that right now, because we don't know how, how deep we can go. Um, in that uh, that bit that you uh, mentioned, um, you prompted four questions for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll start with the easiest one. Uh, how did you settle on Quick Nick? Oh, this is a stupid. I'm allowed to swear, right? I'm oh, yeah, absolutely. This, this is for grown ups. Stupid fucking story. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was editing the first episode and um, 
I was at the time I was a cigarette smoker and um, I, uh, when I recorded the first episode, I hadn't uh, told the caller what my alias was going to be because I hadn't decided what my alias mm -hmm. was going to be. But I went outside for a smoke and started thinking about it. And I, I, I said, I just went outside for a smoke. What I went outside for was a quick Nick, Nick. quick nicotine hit. I get it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and here Clever. we are. <laughs> All right. Um, the um, if you don't mind uh, me asking, uh, what was your drug of choice? I would say I was a poly addict of sorts. Um, uh, I don't think that I ever had a specific DOC. I think okay. that it was always it was always about any substance that could numb my pain mm -hmm. and and help me in some cases just move on to the next day without fearing the next day or getting lost in my thoughts about the day prior or the days or the months prior was anything that could that could make me feel as though it was gonna be okay for that one night mm -hmm. um, yeah i understand so, that that's yeah, that's I, that's anxiety is what that is it's just right. beating the hell out of you and it's like you'll do anything you can to just try and quell that demon and it is a demon <laughs> anxiety i have anxiety and depression and i find anxiety is way worse than depression because i've tried to describe it to people i said uh, when you're having a full-blown anxiety attack imagine you've had 16 red bulls maybe some powder substance i wouldn't know what that's like because i've never i've never done anything stronger than whiskey um but it, your heart is racing your mind is racing and you can't calm down you can't and all you want to do is just bring yourself down so alcohol tends to do that yeah it's a downer right, right. literally right yeah. and i think well just to lead off your point about you know comparing depression to anxiety i think at least for me um there was a lot of anxiety and substances helped curb the anxiety but one yeah. of the um effects the 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 effects that you wake up to the next day the days later the weeks later and the months later is the depression yeah which then leads to other symptoms that go back to creating anxiety a good example <laughs> would be when i was in school when i was in university um maybe my substance use would cause me this is a this is a uh, i mean i i don't want it's not a silly example at all but mm. it's it's just the first example that came to mind as how mm -hmm. as to how the um, cycle of addiction or substance use and depression anxiety um, kind of went from front to back and then back to front, which was, you know, I would use to curb my anxiety, uh, that anxiety caused by trying to get schoolwork done, which would lead me to f the, the, the after effects of my substance use would lead to depression mm -hmm. which would lead to more anxiety because the depression caused me to basically basically not do as good of a job as i thought i could do on some mm -hmm. of my schoolwork, which would create more anxiety lead back into substance use and then i get my my project mark back or my test score back or whatever it is and then i'd be all depressed about the about the the score that I got. Um, Were you perchance an overachiever or perfectionist? Yes, and um, yeah. and that's it's interesting that you bring that up because that's what I was thinking about when I talked about all the the ums and the pauses that I mm. do now make when I do the podcast, which I never did when I was on the radio. That was part of the perfection that I was talking about. But it, you know, perfection in in so many ways on, on mm. the radio in school. Mm -hmm. um, and your mind and guess, has never stopped like it never gets a chance to rest when you're when you're doing a broad a broadcast of that nature where you have to be perfect it just yeah. feeds your anxiety even more so so then you'll you know take some sort of substance to calm the anxiety and then you wake up depressed the next day it's a never-ending cycle and and 
you know, it's, it's something that not a lot of people talk about is how substance abuse is part and parcel to a lot of mental health issues. Sorry, my dog's trying to climb up on me here. Then here she comes. <laughs> okay, Lola. That's my mental health uh, drug of choice is my dog. Um, I think, I think that when it comes to being on the air, you're right. Your brain never stops, but also mm -hmm. when you're on, when I was on the radio, I kind of learned to have two brains going at once. The one that was talking on the radio and the other one that was internalizing 47 other things, which became exhausting, mm -hmm. yeah. which then leads to that feeling of needing to calm yourself down in, in whatever way. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it is. It's a, it's a two, it's a snake eating its own tail kind of scenario, I think. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, when you were young and um, you discovered or stumbled upon uh, substances and you kind of realized that they would at first have that effect, how did it come about the first time? You know what? Um in the early years, it was always the first substances I encountered were alcohol. And although I did say I was a poly addict of sorts, alcohol was never anything that I really liked. I mm. never liked the feeling I, I, I wanted to be in control. I want to control over my body. Right. I wanted what I thought was more control over my mind. I always thought that alcohol. Dulled that the, sense. Yeah. Right. It put up a sort of tempered glass in front of your eyes, whereas other substances seem to open your senses up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but I first stumbled upon alcohol and I can't say, you know, we talk about gateway drugs and so mm -hmm. on. And, and you know, I think that's a layered topic. Mm -hmm. um, and, but when I did start to try other substances, interestingly, I didn't turn into an everyday user at all. Uh, for many years, um, okay. but I, when I, when I say that I, I started battling addiction at 14 years old, I could, when I used a substance, I couldn't wait to use it again, but I'd wait weeks, months sometimes mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. it, but I couldn't wait for that feeling again. And it would be hard to fall asleep. It would be hard to focus. Um, wow. and I do remember at that early age realizing that it did temporarily seem to heal, probably not the appropriate word, but it temporary, temporarily healed a lot of anxieties. Mm -hmm. So at a young age, I would try and give myself enough leeway. Um, I would try and just, you know, wait weeks and weeks and weeks and say, okay, now mm -hmm. I've built up enough of this anxiety. Now I can let it go with whatever substance. And that slowly, you know, went from, you know, months between use to weeks between use. And then eventually I was a daily user. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, sounds uh, like hell. At, at first, the times that you were looking forward to, did they coincide either like with events or occasions that you had planned? Or was just sort of like, no, it's been like three weeks now. It's time. They they would coincide with my opportunity to use because mm. um, for the most part, I was using alone mm -hmm. oh. um, because you're wanting to hide your you're wanting to hide um, everything about it. The, the use, how you are when you're using um and so I guess a, a crime of opportunity uh, ah. is the best way to put it. Um, Understood. But I would say that some events, when you talk about events, like definitely some social anxiety, um, awaiting some sort of social event would give me lots of anxiety, which would then fill my tank, which would make <sighs> my, my usage, um, it would be more likely for me to use after that event, for example. Dude. Can I ask you a question and feel free to not answer this if we don't want to, but did, were you aware of the fact that you had anxiety or, is, or was this like 
you, you didn't, because I think so many people don't know what's wrong. They don't know why they feel the way that they do. Uh, and then some people will have somebody in their life say, I think this might be the case. We should see a doctor about this. What was your, you know, realization that anxiety was feeding your addiction and vice versa? Was it, to, did somebody reach out to you and say, this may be the problem? Was it a light bulb moment for you or did you just come to the realization like how did how did it be how was it discovered on your end is what i'm asking i don't think i was able ever able to put a word to it at a young age um i just always thought maybe i was a little awkward <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um i was also an athlete i still am an athlete and i think that um some of those same worries that i felt outside of sports and outside of radio they were the same what i felt outside of sports was the same thing that i felt leading up to for example a, a big sporting event and mm -hmm. so i guess i would have just called it general nervousness back then yeah mm -hmm. um, before you knew what it really was See, right exactly yeah. i'm in and, the arts that would have been stage fright right exactly or nerves yeah right. nerves yeah yeah, and, really, and that what all, it is is anxiety yeah right and <laughs> and, that, and that all comes from wanting to do a good job yes. um whether it be stage fright or or athletic performance and so on um but what's interesting about that is is that i also realized at a pretty young age that my my substance use was making my anxiety worse when i was sober i knew that yeah. i knew that okay. for many years which i think perpetuated a cycle of shame and guilt with myself because I knew I wasn't performing probably at the way that I could in every facet of life I would use because I wasn't performing at every facet of life to to heal that shame and guilt temporarily and then not perform at my highest level in those facets of life and then like I said that cycle just continues mm -hmm. Ugh, shame and guilt is a killer Ugh. yeah it's 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 a never ending cycle and it it I'm I'm happy that you were able to break the cycle because there's many people who never can and sadly we lose them to you know whatever the case may be I don't want to get too specific there but I I have seen um, I've lived with addicts in the past and I've had mm -hmm. uh, friends who who were able to uh, you know get clean and sober others less so. And some who just one day woke up and went, that's it, I'm done. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, literally, cold turkey, everything. Which I didn't know that, and I'm thinking of a specific individual, I didn't think it was possible with this person. And he just one day said, no, I'm done, that's it. Quit drinking. And this was a guy who would drink 24 beer a night, seven days a week. Never missed work, was never late did his job to perfection. But when, you know, it started at 7 a.m. and at 3, 3.01, he was on his way out the door because he had to get to the tavern to get some drinks into him. And he did that for years. And then one day just said, nope. And I don't know if his addiction was fed by, um, I, it, he had a traumatic moment in his life. I can't get too specific here, obviously. He had a very traumatic moment in his life and that drove him to drinking. And he never really got over that. And I think that was what kept him doing it. And then I think the anxiety fed into it. I could be wrong. I'm not a doctor, but sort of I'm meandering here a little bit. I apologize. It's been a long day. <laughs> but it's, it's just a specific instance where I think uh, so many people um, can't control their addiction because they're so afraid of who they'll be without it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. <clears throat> couple things there. Um, it is at times, I guess, a little shocking when somebody can go from using every day to not using at all. But at the same time, personally, I'm not surprised when I hear it. Uh, obviously, there are specific cases mm -hmm. when it comes to, uh, you know, opioid use, for example, where you mm -hmm. do have to do a medical detox or else right. you're going to have a really tough time. But when it comes to, and I mean, to, to an extent, alcohol too, um, mm -hmm. if you go cold turkey, that can have... It can kill you. Right. <laughs> But at the same time, if you break yourself enough, I could see why somebody would want to wake up the next morning and just say, never again. I don't want to do this to myself anymore. Because when you just, you keep hurting yourself. I, I always, <clears throat> I've said this on my podcast before. I think that 
people who are a little less um, sympathetic when it comes to addiction and maybe uh, just don't understand that it is a, a, a mental health disorder. It's a disease really of sorts. I think that people think that when they're abusing substances that these people uh, just don't want to quit having a good time. But I can tell you being mm. addicted to a substance is not a good time. There's nothing good about it. It's not fun. It's 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 the way we self-medicate. It's an unhealthy way to self-medicate. And so when you go so far down the rabbit hole, so to speak, and keep hurting yourself time after time, um, it, it just never surprises me when somebody wakes up and says, I'm done hurting myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, so many... Uh everybody turns to something different to deal with whether it's you know anxiety or depression or maybe childhood trauma that has transcribed itself into both anxiety and depression and then we try and like you say medicate in the only way we know how i never use drugs never in my life here i am i'll be 56 in a few weeks never smoked a joint never did any anything at all whiskey is the strongest drug i've ever taken there are reasons for that it was a conscious decision on my part um but I've certainly had a few hangovers in my day. <laughs> and, and, and largely related directly to the anxiety. It, it was not, like it's never been a problem for me. I'm lucky in that I don't have an addictive personality. But there are times when the anxiety would be so bad, it was just, just give me some whiskey just to, just to you know, slow the heart rate, slow the brain, slow it all down. Knowing full well that the next day was going to be living hell and mm. that would feed into depression. But when you're... You know, when you're, you're, you're in the middle of the ocean and you're, you're looking for a piece of driftwood to grab onto, it's what you do, right? And, and society has enabled us to do that because the, the things we need to make ourselves get better, mental health supports, having somebody to talk to as a man who is struggling with anxiety, and oftentimes many men and women for that matter, I don't even know they have it. Hmm. They just drink to, you know, silence whatever that hamster running on the wheel is and don't want to talk about it because they're afraid of what their friends, their family, their colleagues will think of them. With Jen said, I noticed these kids have opened up and they're just like, no, I, I think I need to go to see a therapist. I'm like, what? <laughs> that, you know, Gen X here, up, rapidly approaching 60, that was not a realistic thought for us at all. We were like, no, no, that's only for crazy people. Yeah, walk it off, buck up, yeah, man up. Rub some dirt on it, you'll be fine. Thankfully, the younger generations have taught myself, and I, I can only speak for myself, how to be open about these things. Uh, how to be open about having addiction or anxiety or depression. Uh, and, and oddly enough, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ari, but it, it, I think addiction in, in many instances is easier for people to talk about openly than maybe anxiety and depression is. What, what do you think about that? Am I being ridiculous or is, is that, you know, because society is, has been dealing with uh, people openly discussing that for so much longer? Uh, maybe uh, I'm wrong. I, I mean, I think you'd be right if that substance were to be alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. and, and before, when this is my, my second, this kind of leads to my second point that I forgot about. And you, you bring back to the surface by me answering this question, but I think that it's easier to talk about when it's alcohol, because in many cultures, our culture, um, here in the Western world, drinking alcohol is a social norm, celebrations, mm -hmm. gatherings, casual meetings, all involve alcohol, um, making its consumption seem ordinary. Right. And to some at first, it seems harmless. Um, it's mm -hmm. widely available. It's legal for adults. Um, and that contrasts many other addictive substances that are illegal or heavily regulated. So the access accessibility contributes to its normalization, which mm -hmm. also, I, also I think contributes to people being open with talking about alcohol misuse or alcohol abuse. Um, and I, I think that you'd be right that somebody is more prone to being open about that type of problem rather than anxiety when it comes to, um, I, I, 
I don't want to guess your age, guys, but I do think I'm a little bit younger. Um, possibly, I'm thinking possibly. Uh, right. And so I think, quite honestly, in your age group, I, I do think that there are stigmas associated with talking about oh, yeah. um, mm. anxiety, uh, particularly amongst men. Um, it's more manly to be addicted to alcohol than to oh, yeah. have anxiety. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. Yep. It, it's uh, there, There's a good man. That man can hold his liquor. Uh, you know why he's drinking that? Because his head is going crazy right now because his heart is beating a thousand miles an hour and he's just trying to calm the demon down. It's like he shouldn't be holding that much liquor. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but you're yeah. right about that. It, it, it's very much a, a different generational thing, whereas the younger generations, I'm thankful that, for the fact that they're open to speaking about it. And not only that, they're not passing judgment on you. There's, there's no stigma attached. If you, you know, I'm, like I said, I'll be 56 in a couple of weeks. I am lucky enough that I have, I've been open about it for a number of years now. So everybody in my circle, I just openly speak about it. And every now and then I'll see somebody get a little bit uncomfortable. And that's when I'll approach them later and go, did I make you uncomfortable? Or is there something you want to talk to me about? And nine times out of 10, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Paul, I think I might have, uh, I might have anxiety or I might have depression. Nine times out of ten, that is what happens. Every now and then, it's like, no, I just didn't know how to deal with it. But I think, and I think when I get that statement, it's because they're not open to telling me that they're going through the same thing. You, you know, mm -hmm. it takes one to know one. You can see it in other people, and I'm sure, are you seen it in other people? Yeah, I mean, people at first always fear judgment in some sort of way you know despite some progress we've made there's still significant stigma around mental health in general individuals fear being judged discriminated against if they're open um about, about their struggles um there's an emotional vulnerability to it talking about your mental health struggle can be emotionally taxing and yeah. might also involve revisiting painful experiences but at the same time i think that if there are people like yourself in this situation that you mentioned leading by example um, and influencing people to reduce stigma and encourage others to open up um, that that ha that makes huge headway in mm. when it comes to talking about mental health and it positively reinforces uh, the message that seeking help and being honest uh, are courageous and positive steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, yeah. <laughs> I, I've never felt courageous about it, to be honest with you. I felt, um, I felt I got to a breaking point where I just yeah. couldn't keep it inside anymore. And I know it made a lot of people uncomfortable. I tried talking about it in the nineties and nobody wanted to hear it. They would say things like, oh, you have a good life. You should be happy. I'm like, that's, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. And I didn't talk about, I, I was open about my depression for a long time. And it was about seven years later that I finally disclosed that I had anxiety. And it was in a, in a moment where I was out with some friends and uh, we we're out to see a, a live music event. And my friend says, I, I'll go get us a round of drinks. I went, okay. And I looked over at him at the bar and I could see he was having an anxiety attack. I could see it physically. So I walked over, I put my arm around him. I said, hey, buddy, um, how you doing? He looks at me and I go, you're having an anxiety attack right now. Don't worry. I got you. You'll be okay. We'll talk this through. Just breathe a little bit and you'll be all right. And and then he he opened up to me about it for the first time ever. And he says, I've had this for, I go, uh, since I've known you. He's like, how did you know that? I go, dude, it takes one to know one. I could see it in you and I hope I can help you. And he said, just, he said, just you disclosing that to me and talking to me and recognizing that me. Uh, you know, he says, oddly enough, I, I should feel panicked because somebody saw that I'm, this is, what's happening to me. Somebody but, saw my secret. Yeah. He says, but somebody who cares about me saw what was happening to me and came to my aid and I feel better now. And he's, he's been able to openly talk about it since then. And I was not trying to, you know, you, your burden is your burden to carry. I don't like to say that, but that's what it is. Depression and anxiety are burdens. How you choose to carry it is up to you. I don't pass judgment on anybody. I carried mine in silence for decades. I don't anymore. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't change the past, but I can forge a new future. Uh, and, you know, I started on medication in, in of all, 
the perfect opportune time, February 28th, 2020, was when I started on <laughs> on, on medication for anxiety and depression. And a few weeks later, later, the whole world shut down. <laughs> so it was like perfect timing on my part, just serendipitous, if you will. But, and I don't, I don't tell people that you need medication. I'm like, everybody has their own path to walk. And I don't know, everybody's got to... Some, you got to figure out your own your own path, right? You, only you know what that is. But I'm I'm always there to try and help somebody if they need, just yeah. need somebody to talk to, somebody to listen to, somebody to just talk, tell them about their experiences. And, and I find sharing, you know, and I was in group therapy a couple of years ago for something not related to this. Actually, uh, it was uh, it had to do with uh, insomnia and and how we were all suffering horribly. And I I was not one to believe in group therapy, but after doing it. Holy crap. Just sitting in a, but, but like I understand how, how AA and NA work now. Sitting in a room full of people discussing the things that they're going through and you realize I'm going through that too. There's a sense of camaraderie and community and safety knowing that you're not alone anymore. And everybody always says that you're not alone in this, but you feel alone until you know that you're not. Mm -hmm. Right. Did someone come to approach you at any point, Ari? With regards to... To ask, if, to ask if you were doing well. Did somebody notice that there was something up with you somewhere along the way? No, I think Ooh. because I had been using so long, you become a professional at being able to hide the fact mm -hmm. that you have a problem. I think that maybe it would display to somebody as just general anxiety, paranoia, general life stressors, but um, I managed to display it for the most part as nothing too out of the ordinary. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, I won't, I don't want to bring you back to when you were at your worst, unless you want to talk about that, but I, I don't want to bring you there. But from the moment where you might have felt you were at your worst to the moment that you decided you know what, I need to change something. Because was that a long period? I felt like I had tried to, uh, earlier I talked about people waking up one day and just saying they're done. Mm -hmm. um, I had tried that a couple times in my 20s um, where you say you're done and then you, f you, f you realize you're not done. I think, mm. I think... It was a slow burn for me to recover. There were as many relapses in recovery. Mm -hmm. um, mm. I think this isn't this isn't too personal, but I think something that I dealt with um, throughout my recovery and relapses was, and I realize this is really particular, but it's something I wanted to touch on, was the role that social media plays uh, mm. and, and how it can exacerbate loneliness when you're when you're feeling alone you're feeling isolated and then you see how other people present themselves and that makes you feel like you leave you're even more lost mm -hmm. um and so i guess um that was a that was I shouldn't blame social media. It sounds a little silly, mm -hmm. but uh, I guess it's a real you, thing, though. Right. Well, it's very. I think it's very much a real thing because social media platforms can they you know, variety of things happen on them. They can spread misinformation and stereotypes about about mental health and addiction, which reinforce negative perceptions. A, a good example. Um, it's not a particular example, but. You know, I'd be scrolling through social media and you see addicts being made fun of, particularly celebrities often mm -hmm. being made fun of for their substance abuse problems. Um, and while I was experiencing um, the same type of issues, it, it made me feel even more isolated, more broken, um, had more shame and more guilt, which then led to more depression and more anxiety, which at one point led back into using Mm -hmm. um and 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 to say so like you know i'm sure those things happened on regular terrestrial television back in the day and like i'd, I'd be lying if i said i didn't you know make a i didn't have some anecdote about something that might have shamed a celebrity 
who was dealing with addiction when I was in my early days in radio and young and dumb and didn't know any better. Um, but uh, I guess this, uh, this point also leads off of what some young people experience when it comes to their mental health. Um, there's cyberbullying, individuals with mental health problems or addiction, um, th their conditions can worsen which deter people from opening up about their struggles because they're, they're fear that they're, they're going to be bullied in some shape or form because they see that celebrities are being bullied with for the same issues. Um, mm -hmm. be, to circle back to my, my previous point, social media showcases like idealized versions of life, making it harder for individuals to admit to struggling with mental health or addiction issues for fear of ap appearing flawed or, or weak um and so in my case i think oftentimes i was dealing with comparative stress comparing oneself to others on social media um and that can contribute to mental health struggles for anyone which increases the stigma associated with these issues um and, and that's not to say there aren't this all of this, there are, there's a beauty in social media. There's increased awareness about this subject matter on social media. The obvious reason, information sharing. These platforms are powerful tools for spreading accurate information about mental health and addiction, helping to dispel the myths and educate the public. Um, and they're also great for advocacy and campaigns, um, organizations, and people mm -hmm. use social media to run awareness campaigns, share right. personal stories, and advocate for mental health and addiction support. Um, and, and the other thing too is, is celebrities and influencers speak openly about their, their mental health and addiction on these platforms, which helps to normalize these conversations. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is I think that some of the younger generation uh, there, there's a dual role of social media and perpetuating and combating stigma. Society can work towards more informed, empathetic, and supportive environments for individuals um, facing mental health and addiction challenges. And I, I'd be lying if I said that social media wasn't, uh, didn't impact my own mental health at times. Mm. Um, and I don't really think that answered your question, but when you talked when you, when you asked the question, Douglas, I thought back to a couple of the, the relapses that I had in my twenties and I always fail. I wasn't watching much, you know, terrestrial TV or anything like mm. that. I was always scrolling through social media. And I think that a lot of my negative thoughts came from my cell phone, scrolling Instagram and shit like that. Um, but yeah, I don't think that answered your question. I kind of did. It did. I think it did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 It did. Um, Mr. Chris, I have a, a, a little clip there. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to load it up. Give me a moment or two. Okay. It might be having a little difficulty. Um, yeah, I am. It, it's um, an author named John Haight. I don't know if you've, you've heard of him. Um, if uh, if our, some of our viewers are, the, are a fan of The Daily Show, uh, he was on uh, very recently. And uh, he talks about uh, youth today, and, and he, he basically calls it the anxious, the anxious generation, and says that it uh, basically that childhood has been essentially rewired at the moment, thanks you know to things like social media. Um, and I just well, I was hoping if we can uh, load it up, we can play it, yeah, and I can get your here. thoughts on what it is he's saying, and you know if if it uh, rings a bell for you. Okay, this was on uh, PBS, so it shouldn't give us a copyright, but we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, fire line, firing line with uh, Margaret Hoover. Why didn't we see this danger coming? So there are a couple of reasons. A big one is that back then, we were, most of us were still techno-optimists. But what we didn't realize is that by 2012 or so, the technology was not something that taught the kids anything. They don't learn how to program. They don't learn anything about computers. They are in a sense, the, the product, they are just being sucked along on a conveyor belt, their attention. Mm -hmm. It's almost as though the companies are able to drill down into their brain and extract their attention, and they extract vast, vast quantities of attention from every child. Um, five hours a day, the latest Gallup, data, Gallup survey, 
Five hours a day is what American teenagers spend just on social media, especially TikTok and YouTube. And that's American childhood now. Why are young people's brains so vulnerable? Um, because he, human childhood is this amazing, unusual childhood in which we have these very large brains. And the brain, you know, it has a certain form when you're a child, but then in puberty, it kind of rewires, it kind of locks down into a configuration, beginning from the back to the front. The prefrontal cortex, in the, um, the, just behind the forehead, is the last part of the brain to, to myelinate, to, to sort of uh, uh, lock down into an adult configuration. And it's guided by local inputs. And so all over the world, traditionally, adults would help children make the transition from child to adult, and they would bring them into local knowledge, and they would get them ready to make this role change. We don't do that. Instead, what we do is hand you this device. So I mean, this is about the worst thing you can imagine to give kids at the beginning of puberty. And the great rewiring radically altered the inputs to children, taking away most of what they used to do, most of their older inputs, including other people, and swapping in screens. And again, we didn't know that that was going to be terrible in 2012. We didn't know it. Now we do. Wow. Does that, because uh, I mean, I, I, I mentioned that you, you, I know, remember that you mentioned, you said you, you started when you were, you, things started to happen when you were a teenager. Does, does any of that ring a bell of some kind for you? Yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, growing up with technology, you're, there's constant connectivity. Like there's an omnipresence of digital communication, meaning that we're always connected, which leads to so many things information overload cyberbullying mm -hmm. unrealistic comparisons like i talked about um i mean and and i'm sure other like you know excessive screen time before bed probably disrupted sleep patterns re leading to increased stress and anxiety i think that um i think that you know, obviously it can, in some people create a lack of physical activity, creating sedentary lifestyles, um, partly due to increased screen time, um, which can contribute to poor mental health, which a uh, poor physical health rather, which then can contribute to poor mental health. Um, I think the one thing about that clip though, um, I, I think some of what children experience nowadays, the, the rewiring, as he put it, isn't all related to technology, though. I feel like, you know, there are other there are other parts of childhood that have been rewired. Um, mm -hmm. Children, children. This is what I notice: is kids today have so much packed into schedules with very little time. This is what I remember as a kid, and 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 this is. This is, this used to eat, I know that this used to eat at me. Having a packed schedule with little time for unstructured play. Mm -hmm. right. I believe, I'm not a doctor of, of any sort, but I feel like unstructured play, quote unquote, is crucial for mental and emotional development. Agreed. Um, and, and, there, and there's a difference between screen time versus play time. The time right. spent on electronic devices has replaced the time used um, to be spent playing outdoors, which is essential to, to mental health. Um, just playing a game of catch. You right. Know, whether it's a football, a baseball, just a Frisbee, just, just doing something as simple as that, which gets your mind away from all the junk. Right. No screen time, fresh air. Yeah, we're, right. not, we're not doing that nearly enough. Right. There's a, the kids probably have an, a nature deficit. And I, I probably had this for, for 10 months of the year when I, when I was a kid in school, which was, you know, a lack of exposure to nature, which as an adult, I know for a fact can be linked to increased stress, anxiety, and depression. Oh, yeah. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think that general media exposure, um, it's easy to say that children exposed to adult issues like violence or sexuality and drug use through the media at an earlier age can lead to some sort of confusion and anxiety. But I feel like 
that's a tough one. That probably probably mm. one that I'm not educated enough to to speak on. But the rewiring of childhood in the digital age, like he talks about, combined with the societal pressures and environmental challenges, um, as he says, has has made mental health a significant challenge for young people. Um, and, and I think that combating that um, just comes down to a uh, approaching mental health through education and supportive environment and healthy lifestyle and access, uh, to, to professional help. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I agree with him. Childhood has been rewired, but I don't know if it's all a, about technology. Um, you know, there's so many factors and, and, you know, I can speak to my generation so many there's, there's a, this isn't generate uh, you guys probably know, just know just as well as I do, but like there's a high divorce rate. There's lots of family conflict among right. many families, um, uh, which can create an unstable environment. Probably more of that than there was back in the day, which affects a child's sense of security and well being, which then leads to uh, depression and anxiety and so on. Um, uh, there are other factors too that have nothing to do with electronics. I'd say, like, you know, I remember this as a, a kid in in high school, where these these it, there's this me, immense pressure to perform well academically um, from society. Mm -hmm. um, so that way you can, you know, for your college and university admissions, which have their own competitive nature, which adds mm -hmm. stress and and um, exacerbates depression and anxiety. Again, so um, I guess that's all to say that. The world is evolving fast and it is partly due to technology, but I think there are other social factors at, at play that are also rewiring mm. children. Yeah, mm. yeah, I would agree. Um, for you, when um, you, when you had, when you decided that you had to make a change, was it one of those things that gradually sort of came to you or Again, as uh, Mr. Grizzly, was it one of those explained or given example of, was it just like one moment you said, yep, you know what, that's it. I can't do this no more. I'm, I'm done. I, um, the first time I sought formal support was uh, around 2014. I went to an addiction counselor and I, um, I, I, I don't think I was ready in mm -hmm. 2014. Okay. Um, in 2014, I guess I was like, what, 23 or something. And uh, my math sucks in 23, 24, something like that. Anyway, and um, I went to an addiction counselor and he gave me some tools and I just wasn't ready to deal with the discomfort of staying sober. I remember driving home from the addiction counselor that day. I'd have to go home and have to do my show. And I remember thinking there is not a chance in hell I'm going to be able to do my show on the radio and go home and stay sober. Mm -hmm. I'm, I am, whatever happens today for the rest of the day, there's something that trigger that, that switch is going to flip on my way home from work. And it's like, I didn't even try. Mm. Um, but what made you go? You're not ready till you're ready though. Right. Yeah, you're right. What made me go? Cause I you're sort of in that in between thing, right? You know right. that there's something and you know enough to go. Right. But you, you also like leave there and you go like, yeah, like that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I knew that my anxiety was only increasing and I knew it was because of substance use. I, okay. I knew that would, that had to be it. I, okay. I, I was, I felt like I was struggling in social situations more than normal. Like I said, I think I displayed well, but, um, I think my social anxiety leading up to those situations continued to get worse and worse. I think for me, it was also paranoia. Mm -hmm. I would be, I, I, it wasn't, it was, I, I was always suspicious of people. I was always suspicious of their intentions and it kept getting worse. And mm -hmm. one side of my brain told me that my suspicions and paranoias were real. The other side of my brain told me this is so absurd. Why are you paranoid about mm -hmm. this stuff? And that other side of my brain that knew it was absurd was able to say, okay, whatever the other side of my brain is saying is that's, that's, it's crazy that I'm thinking that way. I definitely need help. Okay. You're a very self-aware individual yeah. to be able to recognize all of that because I know yeah. other people who have struggled the same way and had no realization whatsoever. Yeah. 
you're very fortunate in that, sir, because uh, sure, you, you did struggle. You did have this uh, terrible addiction, but you are more self-aware than most human beings I've ever spoken to. I like to, which, which might be a blessing and a curse because I feel yeah. like self-awareness, um, I, I think that's a big thing when it comes to social anxiety, being yes. self-aware, being yeah. aware of your, extremely aware of yourself, being aware of other people, being aware of your own emotions, being even more aware of other people's emotions and feelings. I felt like and all reactions to you. Right. Exactly. Um, two-headed dragon eating its own tail while the other one is spewing fire everywhere. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, Yeesh. yeah. Yeah, that's I, hell, man. That that's does hell. not sound like fun at all. No. no. That's yeah, hell. <laughs> See, that's I'm that's my these, definition of hell. Yeah. See, I'm one of these weird people that's like hardwired for optimism and happiness. So it's, yeah, when, when I have a tough moment, I have a tough moment and it's sort of like, you know, that going on a bear hunt song, can't go over it, can't go around it, can't go under it, got to go through it. So I just like take a deep breath. I put my head down and I go through it. Um, cause then, you know, I, I've had situational depression you know, after my mom died, mm -hmm. um, which is like, you know, somebody turns around to you and says, well, yes, of course you're down. You're not going through anything that any normal person wouldn't also be going through in this situation with these stresses. Touch wood. Uh, I've been fortunate to not uh, ha have to experience any of those things, but I have lots of friends who who do, and and, and in my family, my mom was schizophrenic, for example, um, which is you know, you know a whole other kettle of fish, uh, you know, the, than addictions. But um, my first partner uh, was. Uh, the first person I dated and I was uh, with for four and a half years and we were best friends for 26, um, was a, a functioning alcoholic the way that Mr. Grizzly was uh, describing one of his friends. Um, I grew up in foster homes. My foster father was a pretty heavy drinker and he always had the morning rages. Never had nothing, anything nice to say in the morning, that type of stuff. So I, I've been familiar with it from the, the outside. Um, for those of us who have friends, who have people we care about, um, based on your experience of you know talking to other people and, and your own, what should we be looking for if we're concerned about people in our in our midst? In terms of spotting if they may or may not have an addiction issue, an addiction issue, or even just like something like you know that heavy anxiety or something like that that could end up, end up go leading down that path i mean i think watching for at least you know when you just talked now about being in a relationship with somebody who struggles struggled i thought about my relationships which were impacted by my struggle and i thought about how my behavior changed dramatically i became more secretive more irritable more unreliable um, being around somebody who's like this might cause confusion for you. It might be hurtful for you, um, because you don't understand why they're, they're acting differently. Um, you know, so I think that if someone around you is causing emotional distress to the point where they withdraw from you or they isolate themselves, their communication is impacted. Um, I remember my communication broke down to the point where I became so, when I became so consumed with my addiction, I stopped sharing my feelings and my experiences, um, which made my loved ones feel shut out and helpless. And if so, if you're feeling those things, then there's probably something happening with the person that's making you feel these things. Um, so I, I guess generally I would say extreme changes in behavior that you're, you're not used to. Um, and, and I think the thing about that is, is you, you learn as the person who struggles after you learn, um, how important it is to keep open lines of communication to be honest about your struggles and progress um and 
you know, I, I make an effort to listen and, and understand the feelings of people around me because if they're opening up, that means they they want help in mm -hmm. some shape or form. If they're not, then there's probably something that you don't know about mm -hmm. what's going on with them. It's obviously something you don't know about yeah. what's going on with them, which means that um, it might just continue to get worse. Mm. Hey. Yeah, that's... Uh, hmm. No, but it's true. That's, you're talking about it, and it's like, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 I, I, I think back of my my relationship with this person, and it was like, yeah, it did. It, that that's what it was. There was, it was, it was. They had the issue before we met, and because that was something I was used to, it was comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right, had it in the foster home. Just, I just moved from one the house with one addict to a house with another addict with, with the same addiction. Knew. Yeah, it was with familiar. The right? addiction. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the light went on. The, at one point for me, the light that went on was that we'd always end up in these like really, really battle royale verbal arguments. But somewhere in there at that time, because my partner... The, the blackout where you're still like talking and whatnot, but you don't remember anything. And then the next morning, didn't even remember we had an argument, whereas I worked myself up all emotionally and cried and all that kind of was hurt. And like the next morning, so it's like, I don't remember that. And it's like, wait a minute, I'm getting myself all worked up for something you don't even freaking remember? Mm -hmm. Like, why am I doing this? <laughs> right? And then uh, I... It, I, I had to make a change at first. The first change was like time you spend drinking is time you choose necessarily not to spend with me. And then we were spending time apart. Um, you know, and, and same thing with our friendship. And then many, many years down the, the road, uh, it moved from alcohol to other substances. And then the total isolation. Just, yeah, not. We went from having breakfast together every morning pretty much because we lived in the same apartment building to him like being when i moved into my uh, my condo when i got a condo being just three blocks away from each other and him never having time mm. yeah at all at Rout all. routine disruption um it, it's that's a it, plans being can't like i talked about plans being canceled responsibilities being neglected um, those things impact both people's lives and, and it's, it's an indicator that, you know, when, when it, when routine, something that routine being disrupted is such a powerful, um, sign that something is wrong because routine doesn't get interrupted for anyone um, regardless of the routine for no reason at all. There's always a reason whether that routine is, um, whether that routine is important or not, when it gets disrupted, there's a reason. So you talk about not having breakfast together. If you had it, breakfast together every single day, there's, un if you don't know the reason why that routine was interrupted, then there's something, maybe yep. something nefarious going on. Yep. And I didn't know for years. Then somebody came and told me, you know, your best friend does this, right? And I was like, well, yeah, but he did that at a bar. And when he's at a bar, he's drinking and time spent drinking is time we don't spend together. So I never saw it. And then there was a, one day I found out, um, cause you get bolder. Mm -hmm. People get bolder and more brazen. And then, uh, one day, uh, just out of the blue, um, a dime bag of cocaine. He just like, we were about to go camping and get in the car and go. And he just like, opened it up and pushed it right on the table, made two lines, gave one to his friend, took the, the just two lines, both of them, one each, a whole damn bag, right in front of me. So, okay, let's go, jump in the car. And I'm like sitting there and going like, I'm not getting in the car with you. <laughs> it was the first time I ever saw it. It's like, he, it's like, this guy didn't even, like, alcohol, yes, but like didn't even smoke joints. So it's like when everybody's telling me, like, you know your friend is doing this stuff and actually dealing it going yeah right as like and then right in front of me and i'm thinking like have you done this before it's like like have you 
allowed me to get in your car with you after you've done that before? It's like, yeah. And it's like, and it was just so flippant about it. And that's when I realized, oh my God, how many times have you put me in danger? And that was my, because up until then I was fighting so hard to try to save my friendship. And it's one of those things, sometimes the harder you fight, the more you end up pushing someone away to try to keep them close. Um, but that was the, the, the moment the, the light went on and then it, it, it got worse. It got to a point where I was, you know, um, he was in the hospital and there was yellow tape in his apartment and I was cleaning blood splatters off the wall. That's pretty bad. So yeah, um, things, it, it wasn't going down a good path. He, he eventually found his moment and jumped off as well. Uh, got, uh, got off the stuff. Uh, but not before our friendship was over and, and it just couldn't, it, it just couldn't be rebuilt. Um, I hate, I don't want to, uh, oh, it's such a personal question. Ask away. Uh, did you lose people? Not, not like death. I mean, people that, that, that were close to you, did people just say, you know, what, he's, he's, there's just too much drama. I can't anymore and just walk away. I think we may have. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, are you I, was, still there? I was talking. Yeah, my mic just wasn't on. Okay. Um, absolutely. I um, I lost mainly um, romantic relationships, uh, people that I cared about, and I carry a lot of guilt for the pain that I caused, knowing that my actions uh, hurt the people I love, and and that's a, a heavy burden. Um, and, and I. I regret that lost time and those missed opportunities to to be with those people. At the same time, I had to learn those lessons to find the person that I'm with today. Right. And as painful as all of that was, I say this all the time, I probably would have gone through all that shame, heartbreak, hurt, and regret so I can meet this person. I wouldn't have met this person if I didn't learn the things that I learned. But yeah. Um, hard lessons to earn a, a great reward, right? Right. Um, mm. It's uh, you, you learn in those in those times that um, that you you don't want to cause that type of strain on a person. Um, you don't want to lose trust. You you don't want people to withdraw from you because that'll hurt other people for a variety of reasons, but it'll also end up in my case, exacerbating at, at the time for me, my addiction problem. Um, I was, I had lost people because of my addiction problem. And then my addiction problem continued because I had lost people. Mm -hmm. Everything, every, almost every situation ends up feeding itself. Yeah. It's so insidious. Yeah. And geez. Yeah. Um, uh, when addiction caused me to be emotionally distant, um, um, and your loved ones are the last people that you're supposed to be emotionally distant from. And right. I think addiction causes you to be emotionally distant for a variety of reasons. One, because you want to be physically distant mm -hmm. because you're using, um, and two, because you're battling all those demons and, in order to be open with the demons that you're having, you have to be open about your addiction problem. And at the time I felt as though I couldn't be fully open with what I was experiencing. So I think, um, like you said, hard lessons to learn, but, um, I'm, I'm glad that I learned them because I probably would have repeated that behavior. Um, if I hadn't lost these people, I would have repeated it, constantly um and end up hurting those people more and probably wouldn't have learned my lesson enough to meet the person that i'm with today mm -hmm. i'm glad to hear that to hear you say the, the person that i'm with today because it's a uh, I, I love love <laughs> <laughs> she's lovely yeah, we, 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 I, you know, I talked at the top of this podcast about having a rough week and, um, 
if I was feeling as rough uh, in the midst of substance abuse, um, if I if I experienced this type of week that I've been experiencing well abusing substances, I wouldn't be able to have the open lines of communication about my feelings with my partner. Mm -hmm. And that would have made this week even harder, which would have um, right which I feel like I've said it 90 times, perpetuated the cycle of, of substance right. use. No, it's, it's true, though. You're absolutely right. Right. When, so you went the first time and you weren't ready. How long, how long did it take for you to go and then you, you realize that you actually are ready? I think you might be muted there, bud. We can't hear you. Uh, again, I can't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it's ironically, I only turned down my microphone because I don't have any addictions other than to nicotine. So I'm nicking my vape. Ah. <laughs> so I turned my microphone down. Sorry about that. Um, I think uh, when my time in radio was done, when mm, okay. I left radio, I felt as though I had the time and resources to take all the time I needed to work on myself. Um, you know, it's ironic you say that. Uh, we have some friends. Yeah, who, I was thinking that. We have some friends who, same thing, when they left radio, or radio left them, or whichever the case may be, uh, that's when they decided, okay, this is not right. Let's get straight. And one of the things that they'll, they'll talk about frequently is, is how often they still bump into some old radio folks and those people are still doing the same things they did for years they're repeating the same habits the, the same destructive behavior so I, I think something about radio attracts that maybe or 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 the industry attracts it or the industry accepts it maybe I, you tell me um I think hard to say because I've been gone for so long. I've been gone for about three years, but I think, I think there's a lot of people in it who struggle with what I struggled with, which is this um, constant need for some sort of, maybe for not everyone, it was a perfection, but a, I think like we talked about um, performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. I also think that, the reality is, is that business is in a lot of ways struggling and being employed in it continues to gainfully employed in it continues to be harder and harder and harder. And oh, I think yeah. that leads to extra stress amongst the employees, which can obviously, um, which can obviously have impacts on people's mental health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you got to the point where you were ready, um, how did, how did you find help or help find you? Um, I, I went looking for help. Um, okay. I reached out to friends, family, and uh, the other resources that I had being my doctor and mental health professional. And um, that started uh, a routine of um, weekly, weekly, um, therapy appointments and uh, new medication. Um, for years, I'd been on medication, but I wasn't taking it uh, when I should be. Um, the thing with medication for me is it has so many side effects mm -hmm. and I didn't want to deal with those side effects for many years until this point came and I decided, you know what, uh, it's worth dealing with the side effects at least temporarily to at least put myself on a path um, to feel a little bit differently, to allow my thought patterns to change a little bit and give myself a better chance at recovery. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that came about um, about two years ago, two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, it's it, it hasn't been 100% linear. Yeah. Um, Rarely is. Right. And so uh, I think right now, I'm I'm in a good, supportive, loving relationship. I have a great family, good friends, and I have I'm surrounded by solid mental health care professionals. Um, still, always trying to tweak with the perfect mix of medication. Um, mm. And I think I was fortunate in a lot of ways. Getting laid off from radio um, allowed me to take the time to get better because without it, I probably would have 
while still being on the radio, I probably would have continued uh, down the path that I was on. Yeah, the, the downward spiral. Uh, there's, I've, I've heard so many uh, stories like this from people when they got out of radio, how they got clean and sober and talked about, you know, some of their destructive behavior, uh, how, well, we could go on for hours, unfortunately. We don't have that much time. But uh, I've heard so many stories. I have a lot of friends who work in radio. I've never worked in radio, but I have a lot of friends who have. Some still do. Some have recently found themselves unemployed, and they can tell you the stories about um, physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, uh, substance abuse, you name it, that they've all encountered in the workplace. And some of them have come to me and, and said, I'd like to talk about it, but not yet. Like, I understand. I understand. Because if I talk about it now, everybody's going to know who I am. Like they, they want a certain amount of anonymity, but it's a little too fresh. So yeah. to discuss it, everybody would figure out pretty quickly who they were, even if I disguised their voice and said, you know, Mr. X or whatever the case may be, or, or Madam X. Or, so, you know, I have friends who, who want to talk about it, but they just, the, the, the situation isn't right. I mean, I, I, I do want to say that, like, I, I had nothing but great times in radio. I love the industry, love the people. Um, I think that all my, and I can't speak for anyone that you're talking about, but I, I think that all my struggles were simply the product of my own internal struggles. I right. don't think there were any external forces that impacted my behavior. I think it was me, the way I was wired, my temperament, my, my own internal battles. But I could see why anybody from any workplace might have their issue exacerbated by the fact that they're in an environment that isn't healthy for them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we spend a lot of time working and it's, it would be, it makes sense that it can have impacts on our mental health away from work. I think everybody is impacted by their mental health, um, th their work life away from work. Um, and yes, the fact that the industry isn't doing well um, can definitely cause people to have a little bit more fear and anxiety as they go throughout their day. Hmm. Oh, yeah, um, indeed. We have to wrap up soon. But before we do, I wanted to ask um, about your podcast. Um, how, how long ago did you start it? I started in June of 2021. Okay. okay. And um, I would suppose because of the an anonymous format that some of your guests, if you have them, um, it might be the first time they are openly talking about it. Yes. Um, in a lot of cases, they state during the episodes that this is the first time they've talked to somebody about it openly, unless they're a person who's in recovery at the time, in which case they've told, mm -hmm. you know, their peer mentorship groups in whatever form they come in. And also in some cases, um, these people are in active addiction and their friends and family do know. So I guess every case is a little bit different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where you are now in your recovery, how is that for you that people are placing that trust in you? I mean, it's an honor and a privilege for them to call me and and them trust me to listen um, and that they've found some sort of solace in the podcast. And um, I, I think that in that sense, the podcast became its own animal. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I recorded an episode and a good animal, a kind, yeah. sweet yeah, yeah. animal. Um, it became its own animal in the sense that, you know, I aired the first caller and then people started calling. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that every call that I put on reinforces that it's a, it's a safe space that is judgment free. Um, and like I said, privilege and an honor that, uh, I'm the place that they, the person they choose to call to get it off their chest in some cases for the first time. Hmm. And I know you, you don't, I would assume you don't do it to get something, but you cannot help but get something if you do that. So what, what does it bring you? 
I mean, for me, it's my own tool for on my recovery journey because it gives me the sense of community that I'm looking to give mm -hmm. the the callers. Um, and it I gives me that. it gives me my own time to reflect. Um, I see myself in every story somehow, mm. even if the person's not addicted to a sub or didn't struggle with a substance abuse issue. Um, I, I can relate to every person who calls in some way. And so it's a chance for me to also cathartically reflect. Um, and so it's turned into my own little therapy session at times hmm. even though i'm talking to the caller I, i'd be lying if i said at times um i wasn't helping myself too i can completely uh i can completely understand that because I, mm -hmm. I find oftentimes uh when i sit down to do the asmr mental health chat some nights i have i don't know what i'm going to talk about i don't know and then it just flows out of you and yeah, feel better afterwards and there's people in the chat i don't have people who call in because it's an asmr style show but but I always feel better afterwards because I've had a chance to discuss what I'm going through. And I've had people tell me the only reason I kept doing it because people said, you know, that really helped me. I'm like, it did. Yeah. I was able to relate to what you were going through and you gave me a couple of new tools I didn't have before to try and deal with things. So yeah, I get it. I really get it. It's, it's like a therapy session each and every time. Right. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that, you never know what you're going to, I never know what I'm going to get with each and every caller. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, that's part of the beauty of it too. Uh, I, I pick up the phone and they're a complete stranger. And then by the end of the phone call, in a lot of ways, I know the, some of their deepest, darkest secrets. Right. Um, and it, it, it feels good, like I said, to be trusted um, as a safe space for all these people. Now, uh, Ari, if there's anybody in our audience um, who's listening to this and feels that they would like to give you a call, how would they do that? They can reach out through the uh, Addicts in the Dark website, which is addictsinthedark.net. You can click, click call Nick at the uh, top right corner. Um, and then we can set up the call from there. Once you click call Nick, you'll uh, you'll just give me your, your uh, time zone and we'll get in touch from there and set up a time to chat. You can also reach out through email at addictsinthedark at gmail.com. All right. Uh, thank you uh, for that, Nick. My final question. Now that you are where you are in your recovery, what do you look forward to? Life growing. Um, when you're in active addiction, you don't grow. Um, you don't grow emotionally. You don't grow mentally. Um, it felt like I was 14 years old until I was 30 something. Mm, um all, that's a feeling yeah and so now at 33 i feel like i've been growing for a little bit mentally and emotionally and that's what i look forward to um i look forward to i re look forward to continuing to encourage myself to the person to become the person that i always wanted to be aside from the person that just wanted to be a radio host. Mm. Mm. I understand wow. that. Yeah, I understand that. That's what actually you brought. You make me well up in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, all right. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, did you have a question, a final question or something before? No, no. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going through everything in my head right now. Yeah. Um, Ari, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. This was, this was awesome. Uh, we're really grateful uh, because in this case, you trusted us. Um, You're welcome to come back anytime you want if you want to yes, just have a chat no, with us. Great. Yes, appreciate anytime. Because um, we, uh, we do want to talk more uh, about, about the subject. Um, 
you know, as we, we asked you at the beginning of the show, how's your mental health today? We start every one of our episodes. Uh, I asked Mr. Grizzly, how's health is, uh, mental health is doing today? So, uh, and um, yeah, you know, uh, this is a subject we don't want to just deal with once and then say, you know, we did it, tick a box off and said, yeah, mm-hmm. like we did our addiction episode, you know, go listen to it. We, we want st- to, we want to stick with this. So please, uh, you are welcome anytime. If you, if anything happens uh, in the news, uh, or not that, uh, you know, you know, makes your ears prick up and you say, Hey, wait a minute. We, uh, I need to bring that somewhere. Um, y- you always have a home here. I appreciate so. that guys. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. I oh. appreciate your time and your words, your, your wisdom, candor. your candor. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wow. Um, our best to your lovely, lovely lady. <laughs> Thank you. I'll let her know. <laughs> and our best to you. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll talk to you again. Bye-bye. All right. Talk soon, guys. Oh, boy. That's a... Bit of an emotional that's a dose real, right? Yeah, yeah. That's as real as it gets. Um, it, it made me think of a lot of, a lot of uh, past experiences I've had with, with um, friends and loved ones. And, and yeah. you know, it's some of the things he was talking about just lit a light bulb up for me and then it's like yeah anxiety and depression feed addiction and vice versa uh, you know you you turn to the substance to get away from the anxiety and then that that throws fuel on the fire of depression yeah, and it, it works be for a while until cycle. it doesn't right that's right yeah yeah exactly that was heavy but it was good oh. it was worth it i'm glad we did this i'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for uh, for ari and, and uh, addicts in the dark dot net i'll put that back up on the screen there yeah. um here where is it addicts in the dark I've got dot it net. Here for you if you want and uh, check the website out if you want to we'll just show the uh, the web page here on the screen yeah. addicts in the dark dot net you can go in and, and if you click on if you need to go in click the button that says uh, call nick and you can have a conversation with him Absolutely. Um, and as you uh, notice, as you're seeing across the screen, uh, the episodes 45, From the Halls of Legislation to the Depths of Libation, Senator Patrick Brazo. So uh, if you liked our interview with the senator, uh, I think you might like that one too. Um, and uh, it is uh, through uh, Senator Brazo's office, uh, Kits and Cubs, that we uh, were put in contact uh, with uh, Ari and the Addicts in the Dark uh, net uh, podcast, so um, we have to to thank everybody. Uh, you know the the uh, the the office of the senator has been connecting us with people that uh, they thought would bring value, and uh, based on this conversation, we were not steered wrong at all. No, not at all. No. Um, so yeah, uh, Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. Okay, Kits and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we really, really <laughs> loved making this one for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us and about the Addicts in the Dark podcast. If you would like to subscribe so that you don't have to miss an episode, well, you can do that thanks to The Ray Girl. If you scan that QR code that says below my chin, that will bring you to our pod page site. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you click subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. If you would like to help us in other ways, you need to make like Kit Elaine because if she was here this evening, she would tell you to have a great day and remember to smash that button. <laughs> so go to our True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page and there we have like, share, and subscribe. Go crazy. Smash all you want. Have fun. We approve. <laughs> and if you would like to help us in other ways, the QR code that's going to appear right by Mr. Grizzly's head very soon will bring you to our coffee page where you will find the Eager Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund, where you can buy Mr. Grizzly a 
coffee or me a hot chocolate if you would like to help us, you know, market, produce, write the show, find guests for you. All of that helps. Every drop and tittle adds to the pot. So if you happen to be weighed down by the change in your pocket, we're here to help. <laughs> so you go to coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word, and there you will find our tip jar. Anything that you can contribute is great. And if you can't at the moment, that is quite all right, because the gift of your attention is the gift that we cherish the most. And we want to hear from you. So if you've got something to say, True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com is our address, or you can reach us on our Twitter feed at True Eager, our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver, or leave a message on our YouTube uh, page comment. in the comments section over there. We try to read everything. Um, also, because it is Mental Health Walk Week, um, as we mentioned, our mustering point is by the Museum of Nature in Ottawa uh, at noon on the 15th, the day before Father's Day, and we will take a little walk and at 3 p.m we will air our monthly podcast live with our guests uh, senator brazo and his lovely spouse Marie Dr. Marie claire brazo uh, so we hope that you join us for that um, as well our t-shirts are still for sale uh, you will not be get be able to get them in time for the walk but this still the proceeds will go to uh, good causes so if you would like one again true north eager beaver at gmail.com is the email address you just you transfer $35 there and your shirt size and your mailing address and we'll get one to you. And if you just want to make a donation, it doesn't matter for the t-shirt, that type of stuff, uh, that's the same place that you make it, truenorthegreever at gmail.com. Just indicate that it is for the mental health walk and we'll make sure that it, uh, it gets uh, sent over there uh, and not into our tip jar. <laughs> goes to the of the t-shirt which we're not we're not turning a profit on these t-shirts this is no, no. literally the money net, net proceeds for the t-shirts also go straight straight to uh the, the cost is this this is all the, this is not for us no not at all this thing that we're doing if, if you want to tip us separately that's fine but this this is uh, where we're not taking a cut out of any of this um all right, uh, let's see what else. Uh, because democracy is something that you do, uh, remember uh, to write. Uh, you know what? I'm going to, just today, exceptionally, I'm not going to uh, no. talk uh, about uh, no. uh, calling Jeanette Petitpa Taylor for our veterans, uh, but you might want to um, contact um, the Minister of Health, Mark Holland. And let him time know. Around. And uh, let him know. Now, we do understand that each province is responsible for health care, but maybe we can get some uh, weight from the federal government to just lean on the province a little bit. Yes, say, hey. exactly. Yeah. And if you know, write your provincial minister of health, too, and your premiers. Yes. Just tell them that you want better services because you know, right now it's in the news a lot. And uh, there are a lot of people. Um, it seems to be fashionable to poo-poo on harm reduction mm -hmm. at the moment. But harm reduction saves a lot of lives. Saves a lot of lives. And sometimes it buys the time that people need to be able to realize that they don't need to go get help because you can't get help if you're dead. No. Nope. All right. So, uh, yeah, if you uh, can uh, write a letter and uh, ask uh, RP, uh, our elected representatives to uh, really promote harm reduction and get serious about it, that would make us very happy. And you know all the other stuff in terms of what's going on in the provinces for elections and leadership mm -hmm. races, so we won't mention that today. We'll just stick to that. That was well today. All right. <sighs> Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? Yeah. If you uh, have somebody in your circle of friends, family, colleagues, who, who, who you know is, is struggling, find a way to reach out to them. I can't tell you what that way will be. You would hopefully know best, but try and find a way to reach out to them because they probably need your help and uh, they need, they don't need to be judged. Mm -hmm. Don't judge, just help them out any way they can, they, the, any way you can, any way they need, because believe me, you can save a life. Yeah, indeed. <sighs> From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, especially on this for this episode be kind to and gentle with yourself mr grizzly please roll the credits 
You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. 